Good afternoon and welcome to CJTN's live stream. I'm Robert Nagela. Today we're in the coastal island of Lamu, a town rich in culture, heritage and history as well. Specifically, I'm at the Lamu Fort, a fort built by the locals back in 1821 and more than a century later turned into a prison by the British who had colonised this country. It is now part of the museum network here on the Lamo Island and has a lot of heritage from dating back centuries. And that's what we're here to discover. Now, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking to the curator of the museum, the collections manager here, looking at some of the artifacts dating back centuries from China and how it made its way back over here. So come over here, I believe the curator of the museum is, yes, he's here. Um, first of all, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. We do appreciate it. Most welcome. So this is uh, Mohamed Mwenje, and he's the curator of the uh, fort, the museum actually here in Lamu. But first, um, we're not actually at the museum. Yeah. So um, can you just explain to those who are joining us from around the world why we're here today and not at the museum itself? Uh, the museum is currently under uh, renovations uh, in, part in a partnership program with the government of Oman. Uh, we are rehabilitating uh, the exhibitions there which have been up uh, for the last 40 years. Uh, so this is just an effort to give it a, a new outlook, make it more vibrant, and also to reinforce uh, Lamu's connections uh, with the peoples of the Arabian Peninsula. Absolutely, and trust me, I've just I've had a sneak uh, preview of some of those renovations. When it's done, it's going to be quite a marvel. Uh, there's a lot; they get a lot of tourists coming here from all over the world, interested in this island's rich history and its linkages with um, other regions, the Arabian Peninsula, with China, with India, with Europe, all over the world. So next time you're down here, this is one of the places that you need to visit. However, let's get to why we're here. And we want to look at the linkages between this tiny island and China itself. And there's a story we were discussing earlier about um, this fleet of ships that sailed all the way from China, made its way down here. Can you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, uh, this fleet was under the uh, a command of a famous Chinese uh, navigator. Uh, Zhang Ha, uh, who was uh, on his way back to China after having visited Malindi. Uh, unfortunately, one of the ships in that uh, team uh, hit a rock at a place called Pezali, and uh, unfortunately it went down. Uh, but most of the sailors were able to swim, and uh, they uh, reached a place called Shanga nearby, uh, a place where they got shelter, uh, they settled down, and they never looked back. Uh, they uh, married local women, and they were able to raise families. And uh, today, uh, ancestors of these Chinese sailors are still living in the village of Siu. Absolutely. And it's not just that, because there have been some cultural exchanges in over, over time, over that period. Um, some borrowed by the locals here, some borrowed by the Chinese who settled down here as well. Can you just touch a bit about that and on some of the trade links between the two civilizations? Uh, Chinese, Chinese imprints on the East African coast are quite uh, uh, visible. Uh, places like Gedi, you have uh, specifically a house where... Chinese uh, coins were excavated. It's actually referred to as the Chinese, the house of the Chinese coins. Uh, sites like Manda, uh, we've been able to find recently, during a recent uh, archaeological excavation, uh, a Chinese coin was also found. Uh, more pronounced linkages between China and uh, the Swahili coast is actually through uh, porcelain. Uh, porcelain became quite popular, uh, not just in Lamu, but across the globe, uh, because of its quality. China produced the finest uh, porcelain products uh, all the way from the 8th century all through to the 19th century. Chinese porcelain was um, being sought after. Uh, and this, uh, for the Swahili coast, it meant uh, symbol status uh, because it was really fine and that is how the rich actually displayed uh, their wealth. Uh, it was very, very um, important uh, part of the interior decoration of the Swahili homes. Uh, so that is one of the uh, largest, I think, uh, a piece of uh, domestic item uh, that found into the Wiley homes and became quite popular. Okay, and 
Um, do you get a lot of Chinese visitors coming here to uh, see some of uh, the pieces on display? And what are their specific focuses on? Yeah, over the last um, uh, over the last ten years, uh, the frequency of Chinese visitors has really gone up. Uh, most of them are actually fascinated with this place called Siu. Uh, that is actually where the uh, descendants of the Chinese uh, sailors actually currently reside. Uh, but most of them are actually looking for evidence, uh, physical evidence uh, of Chinese uh, artifacts on the East African coast. So they come to the museum to look for Chinese porcelains uh, and other household implements that might, might have uh, found itself in the East African coast. Okay, well, thank you very much. We'll come back to you. I just want to go to uh, the collections manager and have a chat with him as well. Yep. But just very quickly, one of the reasons why I love this place, one of the reasons why I keep coming back to Lamu, um, it's a place that people say is stuck in time. It's an old Swahili island. Um, the houses, the designs are still stuck in time. Um, the culture, the heritage, it's very, very rich. And the bonus says it's just along the Kenyan coast, the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's an island just around the Indian Ocean. So that just adds to everything else. The architecture of this island, um, the food, the dishes, it's, it's something that you must sample. You have to be here to actually understand what I'm talking about. If we do have time after this, we'll try and walk out a bit so that you can just get an idea of what I'm talking about. But before that, I just want to bring in the uh, collections manager, uh, Mr. Mohammed Hassan. If I'm not wrong, welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. We do appreciate it. Yes, you're welcome. Now, um, first of all, just before we get into it, we've got some porcelains here. Yes. And from what you were telling me earlier, this date back centuries. Can you just first give us a brief overview before we get into detail about what we have over here? Yeah, you know, the Swahili people within the entire East Coast of Africa, they have been trading with the entire world. So the first people to arrive in the East Coast of Africa probably could be the Chinese, where we have um, uh, some remains of, of the Chinese uh, porcelains or collections from China, which were used by the Swahili communities in their homes for either for serving food or for just putting them on display on the walls. Um, so first, let's just begin with, which is the oldest artifact that we have over uh, here? Yeah. Yeah, although I'm not an archaeologist, but you find that okay, some of the few patterns which I am able to recognize the, 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 uh, these patterns, which is a koi pattern in, in, uh, on the base of, of, this, of this bowl. Yeah, and some others, like for instance this one, which is some of the oldest, it goes back to the 10th or 12th century back. 10th or 12th century yeah, back, yeah. right, right. So. Um, what is so unique about some of the porcelains that we have over here? Can you just take us through them? Yeah, for, inst for instance, uh, these uh, jars or potteries, see this one, they were brought into the East Coast of Africa, probably used by the soil people. And then they were transformed into uh, vessels which were used for burials, where water would be put inside if someone has died. And then it is like uh, uh, one of the... Uh, the richer caste of the culture of Swahili people, they would carry water to the grave site when then poured on, the, on top of the grave. And that's why they, were, they have been uh, called the, the vessels for, 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 for burial. Okay. And here I see um, Chinese, glazed, this glazed, is a Chinese glazed, yeah, glazed. stoneware. Yes. What's the difference between these and some of the other stuff that we see around? It is the, the, the type of patterns which uh, appears on the surface. For instance, I will show you some of these uh, patterns which uh, reflect the Chinese uh, porcelains or jars like uh, uh, highlighting landscape of houses, some, some of them showing ocean with vessels, moving vessels in, in it, uh, some of, of them showing um, hills or, uh, for instance, the trees growing all over. Okay, and from what you were telling me, you can actually tell the period in which some of these were made and the patterns put on them by just looking on the designs around them, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes you can uh, recognize these uh, pieces of porcelain by just looking at the, the, the type of patterns which appears on the surface or in, w within. But uh, sometimes it's not easy to recognize unless you, for instance, for, you, for, for the archaeology researchers who have done archaeology, they will be able to recognize the period where this um, kind of porcelains or bowls have been used by the local communities in the entire East Coast of Africa. And
because of um, the Chinese uh, descendants who came and settled yes. here on various islands around Lamu, um, some of the local cu uh, cultures began to pick up bits and pieces of their culture as well to use within their own. Mm -hmm. For example, um, and I know we're going to talk about this when we go up there, mm -hmm. the bowl that they, the well-to-do, the rich used to use um, to show if there was any poison in the food. Can you just tell us a bit about that as well? Well, just to pick an example of a uh, kind of porcelain used as known as celadon, although this is not a celadon. Yeah. But, we'll uh, find that upstairs uh, when we go up. Yeah. Upstairs and like, where they were preserved especially for important guests in the household. So when they receive guests, then they will be served with food. So if any food which has uh, poison in it, contains poison in it, then the, that bowl will crack, showing that uh, the food has been poisoned. So they were placed especially for, for serving important people, but sometimes if the food has been, has been uh, poisoned, you will understand when the, the, the bowl itself cracks. And a lot of these uh, Chinese porcelains that made their way mm -hmm. into the East African coast were then used um, as decorations around the house. Yes. Um, I, earlier I was speaking to the director and he was saying that a lot of them were hung all around the yeah. walls to beautify the homes because of the value that a lot of the local people attached to these uh, Chinese porcelains, isn't it? Yes, you know, it started way back. You know, as I said, that the Chinese people entered the East Coast of Africa earlier than, than any other foreigners in the East Coast of Africa. As uh, the architecture of Swahili communities developed, we are, they will uh, highlight their houses, especially in the central gallery, with the, the entire world being decorated with wall niches. And inside these niches, they will display uh, porcelains of such kind of Chinese. So the more they will display Chinese on these walls, it shows highlighting the richness of the Swahili communities as opposed to any other uh, item or uh, collections put on display. And do some of these um, inf cultural influences also go towards language? Are there bits and pieces in the Swahili language that we can relate with the Chinese? I know you're not an expert, I'm putting you on the spot, but anyway, so um, just before we go up, there's a room there which we cannot really go into, but I will tell you one thing, it's a treasure trove. A lot of the stuff from the museum that's being renovated at the moment is in storage inside there. Um, I was lucky enough to be given a chance to get a sneak preview of some of the artifacts in there, and oh my, it is something that is absolutely eye-watering, something that will be on display again once the museum is open after renovations. But um, treasure trove in there, it's one of those places that you get into, you do not want to leave uh, almost immediately, It'd probably take about a week in there. But that's for another day. So um, let's take a walk upstairs because there's more porcelains up there. Yes. There are maps and stuff uh, that you want to take us. But before we do that, mm -hmm. is there anything else that we need to see here? Because I can see there's a Chinese saucer there. Yes. Why is that important? So it's Chinese sources and this because you know we have Chinese cups for coffee mm -hmm. and this was part of this you know uh, this is coffee and this is for holding. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And really today as well you walk into any Swahili shop here when they're serving you coffee, they serve you into the small small cups. Small cups. There's a lot of Arabian and Chinese influences mm -hmm. linked to that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is linked to, to, to that, yeah. Although the current ones is, is not Chinese. Yes. Like, this is the, the ancient Chinese coffee. Uh, where Swahili people were also using in their homes. Absolutely, uh, because then, yeah. this one's uh, the scent bottles. Right. And ostensibly, this would be uh, used by both women and men, or just yes. women alone? you know, for, for women, mostly the women, it's, it's like eyelash, uh, eyelash containers. Yeah, for decorating, you know, this adornment for, for ladies. And is this a practice that was picked up by the locals as well? Yeah, not necessarily from, from the Chinese, right. but it is, has been part and parcel of the Swahili culture. Right, yeah, okay. Decoration. Okay. But although they might have used this mostly okay. uh, from China. From China, yeah. right, okay. Um, what about this piece here? There's a green um, piece which looks yeah, really green. old. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of the, the, the collections of, from China, although not necessarily that used for as a burial. It could be used for... Uh, water, holding water in it, or could be part of the uh, decoration in, in a soil house as displayed on the wall. Okay, okay. 
Shall we go up? Yes. Shall we go up? Yes. Okay. So um, we're just going to take you across upstairs, have a quick sneak preview up there, show you what's up there as well. But as we do that, um, spread all around this fort are cannons like this one. So ostensibly, this would have been placed at some point at various points for, to protect the fort and the people around that were being guarded around here. Um, it's a very interesting place. There's been some renovations done over the years, but um, basically this is a lot of how it looked like. This is the archaeology lab. I'm afraid we're not allowed in there at the moment, but let's go upstairs. And uh, so as we go up, can you tell me a bit about the history of this fort itself? Um, as my supervisor has already said that you know, the fort was constructed in 18... 1813 up yeah. to 1821, when well, it took about nine years to complete by the local people. Right. Yeah, and in fact, the main reason why the fort was constructed, because as you can see, the fort itself, uh, basically it is in the center of Lamo Island. Right. It divides into between the Langoni sections, which is the southern side, and the Mkomani area, which is the north. So basically, it became the baseline of Swahili communities, of Lamu town, where you're, it's the, you know, the harbor. When you enter Lamu, the first place you see is Lamu Fort. So, okay. I just want to bring in the director as we make our way up there. Um, this particular floor, the first floor, what's so important about this particular place? What, what is on display around here? Uh, this is an important floor. Uh, number one, it has uh, uh, the only public library in Lamu town. Right. Uh, so this is very useful, not just for researchers and uh, other enthusiasts, but it's uh, very useful for the community because it's where the kids can come and uh, do their studies. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, a lot of ethnographic uh, collections uh, for the Swahili. Uh, for example, the gallery just immediately here is the Maulidi Gallery, uh, which features one of Lamu's most important uh, uh, events in the annual uh, activity which is the Maulidi Festival. Okay. Uh, further on, we have uh, galleries uh, which are showing uh, Swahili furniture, right. uh, for maritime trade, and as well as uh, a little bit on uh, archaeological uh, excavations uh, from a number of sites uh, within the region. And just uh, briefly for our viewers as well, um, Lamu hosts uh, two of the best cultural festivals in Kenya. Um, I dare say in East Africa, although I've not been to all of them, so I'll be very careful with that one. But we've got a festival coming up in October. Oh, yes. Uh, Maulidi Festival is just around the corner. Uh, this is, has been big for the last 100 years. Uh, it attracts people from not just the East African region, but further afield. Uh, people from the Middle East, people from Europe, they also all come to uh, take part in this. And then uh, in November... After about a uh, two-year absence, uh, we are going to have a mammoth uh, Lamu Cultural Festival. Uh, the governor has personally uh, made that pledge uh, that we are coming back and we are coming back with a big bang. And uh, <laughs> look, I'll just tell the viewers, if you're able to, it's one of those things that you need to attend. Culturally, it is huge. Historically, it is massive. And things on display in terms of culture, foods and a lot of other stuff is absolutely amazing and so are some of the cultural dances practices and so on that will take place we'll along display that, on display here yes. isn't it okay so uh let me just go back to muhammad uh who's trying to what it, what, what, what what this is what what's this muhammad this is one of the the drums used uh highlighting the, the, the typical Swahili cultural dances where during the Maulidi festival and the cultural festival, festival people entertain guests uh -huh. along the, 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 the street or the seafront. Okay, so what, the reason that we're up here on this first floor, let's start over here. Um, perhaps this map, why is this important in terms of what we're discussing this afternoon? Most importantly, here I see the, 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 the route here, the red color is showing the Silk Road. 
uh, when the Chinese people uh, entered the east coast of Africa, I mean, they traded with the local people, the Swahili people in the east of Africa. As you can see here, we have Indian uh, uh, monsoon trade winds where they were able to exchange materials, goods, from China to Lamu and then from Lamu to China. So some of the collections we had from China uh, included the silk and porcelains brought all the way to Lamu and then the Chinese were able to get uh, some of these uh, uh, seafood like the sea cucumber. So this was a delicacy for the Chinese, wasn't it? For the Chinese, yes. Okay. Where the, the fishermen will, uh, will fish the, the sea cucumber, dry them and then export to, to China. So what we're basically looking at here, uh, dotted in red lines, all the way from Cantun in China, coming to Rangoon, Calcutta, the, in India, the Madras, all the way to Basra, the Arabias, to Mogadishu, coming all the way down to Lamu, yeah, the is the famous routes. silk yeah. trade route. Silk trade routes, yes, okay. of course. Okay. Yeah. And this lasted centuries as well, isn't it? For many years. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, and then we've got another map on this side. Why is this important? The map, it is highlighting historical sites and monuments of Lamu region. And uh, I will uh, pinpoint uh, key areas where Chinese settled. Uh, included Manda Island, in Man uh, Manda in Manda Island. Then we have Shanga in Pata Island as well. See so where uh, the, with the wrecked ship, uh, I mean, some of the few survivors who landed in from the China. The, this is from the wrecked ship, from right? The ship, right. Yeah. So that's where yeah. it all began. And that was uh, probably in around 1425. Right. Yeah. And then they survived and then landed in Shanga and then also moved to, to see where they are, the, the descendants of the Chinese were said to be settling uh, in, in Seal. Yeah, I, I covered um, a story um, on those descendants, mm -hmm. which took us all the way there. That was about a decade ago. Really interesting yes. historical perspective from some of the descendants yes. um, from the Chinese uh, fleet that uh, was shipwrecked there. Okay, and then from here, so um, so there's my go there's, this is Bonnie. That's my this Dondo. Is the last one, Dondo. You know, they also believed the Chinese believe were believed to have settled in in that uh, one of the Swahili settlement. In, okay, yeah. And this was around the 14th century we're talking yes, about, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so from there, we then go inside here, inside because this is where... Uh, uh, this is highlighting some of the few of my Chinese collections. Okay. So, and this is our particular area of focus, of concentration. Why is this so important? Uh, as outside there, I was uh, highlighting, showing you the, the trade link between East Africa and, and the Chinese and the rest of the world. But most importantly, as you can see, we have lots of collections uh, here in the museum. Uh, we're showing that there was uh, a lot of movement between the East Africa, West Africa and China, whereby the Chinese brought in their uh, manufactured products. As you can see, we have uh, celadons and porcelains put on display. And in fact, this kind of porcelains were also used in Swahili homes for either displaying on the walls or for serving uh, food to important guests. And in fact, it is reflecting the richness of Swahili culture uh, when these porcelains are put on, on display. Now, the one I want us to start with, the one I want us to focus on first, is this one from the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty. Uh, you know, the history, when I get the, the, the uh, Ming Dynasty, it is... Uh, it became uh, the highlight of, of Chinese history in East Africa. As well, you can see that in, in Swahili community, they have collections, uh, thousands of collections of uh, porcelains of Ming Dynasty, reflecting the history of China in East Africa during that period. Okay, and then we have this one here, number 19, which says Chinese, that's a long word, Chinese? Um, Christ sent them mum mum and scroll pattern. So pattern. that's looking at basically the design, the design of it. Can you tell us a bit about that? It could be one of the ancient uh, uh, designs used by, by the, the Chinese in uh, designing these kind of, of porcelains. Uh, sometimes you will find these kind of porcelains of the small ones being uh, put in, inside a cistern, birika, just for decoration. Yeah, not necessarily that can be used for serving food. This is one of the ancient or the earliest patterns produced by, by, by China. Okay, and just to our viewers, remember downstairs when we were discussing about these Chinese celadons that 
well locals used um, to tell if the food they were being served was poisonous or not. This is it here. This is the celadon, the green porcelain up here. That is the celadon. What can you tell us about that particular one? Uh, in fact, uh, this kind of uh, celadons were very rare. In fact, uh, very few, uh, in fact, rich people would uh, uh, be able to have, to own this kind of celadons. It, it reflects the richness of, of, of this kind of, of celadons. They were only preserved for important guests in the house. So when they receive guests, then they will be served food using within these uh, celadons. For instance, if the food has been poisoned, the food, uh, the, the, the celadon itself will crack, showing that the food uh, has been poisoned. Okay. Yes. Now, um, and then here I can see number 25, yes. Chinese monochrome. Um, what is that exactly? Chinese monochrome. As you can see, you see, it is uh, in brown color. It is my Chinese monochrome. And then the, the Islamic monochrome, which is this one, 27, Islamic blue that and one, white monochrome. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know, because of the link, uh, how they were able to, 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 to trade, and then people will have ideas of producing porcelain or balls similar to those of, of China. Like, as you can see here, white and blue, and then we have one which is plain but in, in, in brown color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the, the most, as they produce the more uh, of these uh, porcelains and bowls, then they will produce which, the ones which have no decorations, it's just plain. So we talk about now cultural exchanges, yes. for example, between the people of Kenya, the people of China. But this cultural exchanges and influence has begun centuries ago. Yes. You can see uh, the adoption of some of these artifacts mm -hmm. and how they were put to use by the locals mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, descendants coming here. So these exchanges and influences date back centuries, don't they? Yeah, it is. It's not 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 uh, uh, not about the porcelain or maybe collections only. It's even language in terms of food and the, the way lifestyle. Uh, Swahili people adapted to different cultural background, and that's why uh, we came up with a very unique Swahili culture, being able to mingle with lots of foreigners who entered East of Africa and stayed with the local people, and they were able to adapt into different cultural lifestyle. And it's still very rich up very until rich. today. Yes. That's the most amazing thing. Yes. Um, you can trace this back uh, different periods, uh, but it's still at the base of it. The Swahili culture remains Swahili culture intertwined with a bit of Arabian, a bit of Chinese, a bit yes. of all these other influences yes, inside. And that, I guess, is what makes it very, very unique. Very unique in terms of architecture, in terms of I mean, the mode of dress, in terms of in the way we speak. It's very, very unique. I, I'm still hoping that I'll be able to give you viewers a sneak preview outside this fortress of what the town Lamu, I think the square is just behind here, isn't it? Yes. The Lamu Square. So um, is there anything else you want to touch on here before I go back to uh, um, the curator? I think this, this is it because as I have shown you the different patterns put on display which were in fact as a result of the, the, the Chinese collections brought into the South Africa through Indian Ocean trade. And also, just reading up here, I just see that um, Chinese, some of the Chinese porcelain was brought to the coast of East Africa in exchange for things like ivory, ivory gold, yes. Yes. grain, and spices as well, yes. isn't it? Yeah, of course. Yeah. In fact, in the Lamo Archipelago, which goes in Lamo Archipelago, the entire East Coast of Africa has been part of, of the uh, I mean, mass production of, of spices, which including Zanzibar, where they were exported to many parts of the world. Okay, okay. Well, um, look, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us, educate us, give us a little historical background on some of the cultural influences, integration between the people uh, of Lamu, the Swahili coast, and uh, the Chinese as well. We do appreciate it very much. Okay. And it's really important work that you do here. Uh, one uh, more thing, maybe yeah. to say, because uh, my supervisor has said that uh, the current Lamu Museum is under renovation, yes. and uh, we are hopeful by the time we open it, we will dedicate one full gallery uh, as a Chinese uh, gallery where we will put on display collections which links back to China and the history of China in East Africa. A full and entire gallery. The entire gallery will be dedicated to be, uh, it will be called Chinese gallery where we put on display collections which uh, uh, links the history of China in East Africa.
So you've had that first here on CGTN's live stream, an entire gallery dedicated to uh, Chinese influences, artifacts, historical backgrounds, and so on and so forth. So if there was any, ever any reason to just come and visit this tiny, beautiful island, that was it. Thank you so much. So I want to take you now to back to uh, Mohamed Mwenje, the curator here. Um, so, Mohamed, Let's talk about um, some of the things that we can look forward to once this uh, renovation is complete. We've just had an entire gallery dedicated to Chinese artifacts and cultural influences and so on. What else can we look forward to for some of our viewers out there who are watching us from around the world interested in uh, what is on display here and what this little town has to offer? Um, one, uh, I mean, over the last uh, 50 years, uh, there's a lot of research which has been undertaken, a lot of information has come to the fore, uh, so we are going to correct um, uh, previously uh, uh, unclear uh, issues about the Swahili identity in overall. Uh, we are also going to retell the story of uh, uh, East African Swahili coast and its connection uh, to the Arabian Peninsula, and you have, you have just had uh, uh, one of the star collections that we are trying to introduce uh, is the Chinese gallery. Uh, we have uh, dedicated staff of about four people uh, working on it, uh, including Mohammed. And uh, uh, this is just dedicated to uh, the increased uh, people from China who are visiting the museum. And uh, we are responding uh, to their interests, uh, mostly which is uh, a little bit of the artifacts, uh, including um, uh, porcelains, uh, but we're also going to highlight uh, the story of Zhang He, uh, who has been uh, accredited as one of leading navigators from China, and also uh, uh, some of the people, uh, some of his crew, uh, who uh, unfortunately uh, uh, crashed in the ocean on their way back, and they settled in uh, Siu. Uh, that is going to be one of the centerpieces that we're hoping uh, to put up. Uh, and, to build on that uh, narrative of the Chinese East African Coast Connection. And just to add on to that, because, um, and why you really do not want to miss that bit once it's up and running, is because Zhang He was not just a navigator, he was a brilliant tactician and strategist on this seas. And um, his history is uh, something to savor, so something to look out for. Like I said earlier, lucky enough to get a sneak peek into the storage area where a lot of those artifacts that will be dis on display once the renovations are complete are. Uh, are being stored at this moment and fortunately for security reasons and because there's work being done there we can't take a camera out there but once those renovations are complete um, we will hopefully be able to take you around the entire Chinese gallery so that you can have a, a proper understanding historical uh, view and background of just all the stuff that's here, what it means and what it links back to, what period in time and so on and so forth. So. Just before we leave you, because I want to see, hopefully our live signal will stay with us, to try and take our viewers, uh, because we've got people from around the world watching us now. Sure. I want to try and take them outside. Hopefully okay. the signal will stay with us. Um, for those, of, those people who are watching, those who are interested in uh, Chinese cultural influences and the Swahili cultural influences, its integration, so on and so forth, what is your message to them? Um... Lamo culture, Swahili culture in general, is a palette of cultures. The whole globe is representative, uh, represented in this uh, independent, former city, independent city states. So, uh, if you want to understand humanity, please come to the Swahili coast. Absolutely. I, I agree with him on that. I'm not going to argue with him on that. And just very quickly before I let you go, I know I said that was the last yeah, exactly. thing. Um, when do we expect those renovations to be complete? Uh, we are hoping to have the uh, museum reopen before the cultural festival. Uh, that will be sometime in early November. It okay. Should be up and uh, will that be before the second festival? Or? Yes, that's before the second festival. All right, so it will be up and running. That's one, another reason why you need to make your way here. And for those of you worried about accommodation and so on, listen, there's a lot to go around in this place, so get yourselves over here. Mohammed, thank you very much.
Pleasure. For taking the time to take Thank us you. and our viewers around your uh, fort. I know there's a lot we've not seen around the fort yet, but that's because we were focusing on a particular topic. Um, also, uh, special thanks to my other guest, Mohammed Hussein. Pleasure. Thank you very much as well. He is the, the collections manager here. Uh, a wealth of knowledge. Again, both of them. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so I'm going to take you guys downstairs now. We'll let them get back to work. But uh, thank you. I know we've been a disruption, but we do appreciate it. So let's go back down. Let's see if we can just get a really quick uh, sneak preview before we let you go. Um, come down this side. So um, this fortress, I don't know if JP, do you want to just go down that side? Just give him a sneak peek. He goes all the way down that side. There's more stairs leading downstairs there. Um, there are, I believe, still some prison cells um, in this fort that are still preserved. Uh, I don't think we have access to that right now. But um, so what JP is short taking you through at the moment are just some of the local designs of chairs beds and so on that were used back in the day and in some of the local hotels that you go to at this particular stage are still in use up until now there you've got some local photos of the locals who will make some of this the architecture doors chairs and so on and so forth and then just really quickly that goes up all the way up to the roof where this may just be able to give you a really good idea of this island i hope our signal is still strong yes so I'm sure if we'll be able to see anything up here all right here we are so um on this side i believe okay so it's a maze of small rooms, big rooms, all used for different purposes back in the day. Like I said, uh, this was ready in 1821, uh, it, built by the locals. Once that was done, when the British came over in the early 19th century, then took over, turned it into a prison. Um, POWs from various wars, the world wars were stored, were kept here. And here, this is a site to savor. This is the sea. That's the Indian Ocean up here. Uh, there's a wooden staircase here. Yep, it's yeah, it's strong enough. JP, you can come here with me. So ostensibly at some point there would have been cannons facing the sea in case there were any intruders or enemies, what was called at that particular time. Uh, they've all been moved there now at various sections on this side. But yes, so um, on that side, you can probably just get a glimpse of the old architecture here, the doors and so on and so forth. And I don't know if JP is ever able to come down this side. The square is just below me. Uh, this has been there, I think, for over a hundred years now, but um, still maintained. There's a very old tree. I'm told it's more than a century old. So I don't know if the camera can just pan downwards. So have a look at the square down there. There you go. Um, there's two cannons out there facing out. The building that's in front of them was not there at that particular time. Um, there's a group of locals on towards your right playing some board games. Um, this is a pastime on this island where you have the older gentlemen of the island uh, playing board games in the afternoons, especially when it's too hot to do anything else. Uh, John Paul, watch your step. There's a few holes down there. But yeah, you get a really good view, sneak preview here of the island itself. Uh, we would have panned that side, but that's where the sun's coming from. I'm not sure that will do you any good, but gives you a good idea of what's happening on this side. So we'll go back down now. Um, it's been an interesting trip. Really thankful and appreciative to the management of the fort itself and the Lamu Museum for letting us come in, spend the afternoon here, getting to know uh, a bit of history, touching on culture between the Chinese and the Swahili people. Um, if there was ever a time where you wanted to learn to experience, to catch up, to get to know and understand the Swahili culture, this is where you come to Lamu. Because like I said, you go downstairs, it's almost like everything's still stuck in time. Um, so as we wrap up this, I want to see if we can just get downstairs, give you a quick sneak preview. And then um, we're hoping that once this 
uh, museum is done, the renovations itself, we will definitely be here for the opening. We will be here for the Swahili Festival in November as well. And we hope that you will join us and come along for that journey. It's going to be very, very interesting, educational, knowledgeable, but lots of fun as well. Um, taking a bit of history, a bit of culture as well, and all that all together. So the easiest way down. Now, this is what I want to just bring to your attention very quickly. As I said, this was a prison before. There's been some renovations down here, but you can see this. We'll give you a really good idea when I told you that this was a prison before. You can see there's, there's been some work done to it, but that's very old. It's been that way for quite some time. So ostensibly, I'm not sure if this what this was back in the day, whether it was still a stairwell or a room of some sort. But yeah, so let's go down, JP, see if we can get up quickly. These are wooden steps built way, way back. Um, as you can see, it's still really, really strong as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us again. We do apologize. We had some technical difficulties, but we've sorted those out. Thank you to the team back in Beijing and uh, Jean-Paul, my cameraman here. So we're now outside the fort itself. Jean-Paul, if you could just come down with me, then I want you to just go up so that we can give people a quick view of the fortress as it looked outside. Can you, if you can just find upwards. So there you have it. That was what the fort looked like from outside. And here, right next to me, you've got the cannons themselves that would have faced the sea itself. Now, where we're standing at this particular moment, this is the main square. This is the town square uh, that uh, people will gather. And during those festivals that we were talking about earlier, there's a lot of activities that carry on over here from cultural dances and so on and so forth. It's quite a busy place. It's a bit quiet right now. It's uh, late afternoon. A lot of people would have gone home. You've got some market sellers on that side, uh, some shops open and so on and so forth. And uh, these buildings that we're now looking at are buildings that have just come up uh, just recently. Just before we wrap up or as we wrap up, I just want to take you through one of the famous 
streets of Lamu. There are no vehicles here because the streets are too narrow. So the mode of transport here is either on foot or donkeys. That's how people move around. But because it's a small uh, integrated community, everybody knows each other. Um, so walking is the mo usual mode of transport. So this is just one of the uh, streets that you will find in this small, small town. And as you can see, it's very, very small. Some of the influences that you find across this entire Swahili town. This is one of the reasons why you can't drive here. Um, but the one thing you begin to notice very, very quickly as you look around is the architecture. There's a Swahili homes maintaining that architectural style for centuries, two, three centuries back. But the one thing that you have to look out for when you're talking about the architecture is the doors, the designs that go into them. There's a lot of Islamic influence in it, Swahili influence. And like that though, for example, just have a look at that. Look at the, in, the design that the work, workmanship that went into that door is totally amazing. And these you find all over this island uh, when you walk around. It's a very interesting place. There's different shops, uh, different things to experience. The sea, the Indian Ocean is just behind us. There's more streets all over the place. This, as I said, is the main square. And with that, um, I'd like to invite all of you to visit here, learn about the cultural influences between the Chinese and the Swahili along Kenya's coastal towns, which is very, very interesting. We've tried to cover quite a bit within a very small chunk of time, and I hope it was worth your time. So thank you very much for joining us here in Lamu, this UN a UNESCO Heritage Site. I'm Robert Nagela and my cameraman is John Paul. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.